Jesus was the most meek and gentle of men. Matthew quotes Isaiah 42, saying of Jesus, He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. Listen, then, to this gentle man. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Jesus wasn't always gentle in his word. But as I look at his verbal confrontations, I find him, I find them to be focused on one subject, hypocrisy. And in this focus, he stands solidly in the tradition of the prophets, including Isaiah. Now, fortunately, in 2,000 years, God's church, the community of his people, has never fallen into the hypocrisy that God hates. Not Sadly, we have often given the world cause to call us hypocrites, and our enemy takes every advantage of that. So in our text, Isaiah 58, God challenges us to examine ourselves for religious hypocrisy, and he reminds us that true devotion is expressed in compassion to others. Now, I've mentioned the book Unchristian before. It resulted from a three-year study of the convictions of unchurched people about the church. The details are fascinating, but to put it succinctly, 91% of unchurched people think the church is homophobic, 87% think the church is judgmental, and 85% think we're hypocrites. And we, the church, have probably given people some reasons to feel that way though other people in that huge percentage probably judge us based only on what they've been told and what they hear in the media, and the media can be so wrong. I read a long, fascinating article about Jerry Falwell's Liberty University, which gave extended examples of this school's staff meeting a particular person's homosexual orientation with compassion and truth and actual help. But I don't think many people, even Christians, would believe that. The Westboro Baptist churches of the world are seen as the norm to 91% of our population. And we have too often been guilty, especially of these other things of judgmentalism and hypocrisy. So we as a church need a chapter that begins by exposing the hypocritical devotion of God's people. Isaiah 58, 1 through 5. Cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you have seen it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast I have chosen? A day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? 
Last week, Todd described some interesting elements of Isaiah, including the fact that the last 27 chapters are like the 27 books of the New Testament. Here, Isaiah is looking forward to the New Testament, to the redemption through the suffering servant, and to life as redeemed people. In other words, these last chapters of Isaiah look forward as much to our situation as they do to the circumstances of Isaiah's own nation. So Isaiah 55 last week was a clear call to our day to follow Jesus, even though his name wasn't mentioned in that chapter. And in the same way, the warnings of Isaiah 58 apply very directly to us, to God's church in our day. As one commentator says, God is moving toward the new heavens and the new earth. He has sent Christ, his servant, to bear human guilt, to justify the ungodly, qualifying them for this new world. He pours out his spirit upon those he has redeemed. And what he wants now is his church to be the model home for the new neighborhood he has promised to build. What kind of church is persuasive in that role? What kind of church is preparing the way for the Lord? Isaiah tells us. And his message is challenging, not because it's all that hard to understand, but because it's just plain blunt. So this is a warning. God tells Isaiah, cry aloud, declare to my people their transgressions. And what do we expect to read next? What are these sinful people going to be accused of? And maybe it's surprising because Isaiah says, they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to me. If you, heaven forbid, had to move to a new town and you found a church that sought God daily, delighted to know his ways and to draw near to him, you'd probably join that church. But Isaiah might not. It's possible for a church to do all these good things while still having major issues in God's eyes. Isaiah hears them asking that question. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? I mean, is it fasting, humbling ourselves, evidence that we take sin seriously? Why are things still desperate? Why isn't God responding? Because they think they can obligate God, pressure God. And when they're fasting and praying, don't lead directly to God's blessing, they resent him. What poisoned their souls toward God was not sins like thievery and murder. It was their own false religion. You see the key there in verse 2. They are doing these things as if they were a nation that did righteousness. They were role-playing righteousness. So God is warning his people that religious show, hypocritical sham, is sin and leads to judgment. And this is where we have to begin to identify ourselves in this text. It's easy to make a list of what our subculture, evangelicalism, considers Christian and godly behavior. Go to church on Sunday, attend a home group, read your Bible and pray. Even, even fasting can be on this list. And on top of that, we add expectations like keep your kids under control, dress modestly, don't watch R-rated movies, certainly don't do porn or drugs, and a lot of these are good things, important things. But the things described in the passage are good things too. And God calls them a sham. So we have to ask ourselves, we have to ask ourselves if we're being hypocritical in pursuing those things while neglecting true heart change. In verse 3, God begins to expose their true hearts. In the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. The first phrase reveals the temptation we all face. We say we're seeking God, but we do only what we want and what brings us pleasure. Now, I'm not saying serving God shouldn't be joyful. He did make us to delight in him, but it's so tempting to cross the line and seek our own pleasure 
under the facade of devotion. I read this week about Vaughn Reeves, who's serving 54 years for investor fraud. At his trial, witnesses said his biblically-based, church-based company, Alinar, was started with the best and most godly intentions of helping people. But as millions of dollars flowed through his fingers, Reeves began to take more and more for himself and his sons, ultimately siphoning $6 million into airplanes and homes while losing hundreds of millions of dollars invested by innocent and often retired church people. And I don't think even Reeves could tell you when his heart shifted from devotion to personal satisfaction. But it did. That's how our enemy works. And I think in many cases of sexual scandal in the church, the pastor or even the priest started out wanting to be compassionate or or simply friendly. But then sexual pressure began to be a subtle focus until it burst forth into full-blown sin. You seek your pleasures. And the second phrase, you oppress your workers, is a bit further removed from any of us. Though some of you here do control other people's schedules and their salaries. Some of you can hire or fire. And those responsibilities, like all of our responsibilities, must be done not in spite of devotion to God's ways, but in light of devotion to God's ways. We need to be sensitive to his ways in every area of life. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. You have neglected the weightier matters of the law. You have neglected justice and mercy and faithfulness. So shouldn't I be asking whether my devotion to God is leading me to desire justice for the wronged, to show compassion to the struggling, and to be faithful even in difficulties? That's what God desires. And Isaiah gets even more personal in verse 4. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and fight and to hit with a wicked fist. So here you are. Praying and fasting, asking God for something, probably something really good, but at the same time, you are pursuing known grievous sin in your own life. In two weeks, we're going to start a series applying verses like these to family situation. And this one applies because for us, it's in families mostly that people pound their loved ones with Bible verses while pounding them verbally or physically. Again, don't get me wrong. I believe physical discipline is a legitimate tool in child training. Scripture is as well. But both must be applied in compassion through tears. This fist, this violence, this quarreling and fighting comes from anger and from wounded pride and from selfishness and from fear. And it's one of the most damaging hypocrisies in God's church. God longs to get hold of you at the fundamental level of controlling your voice, controlling your words, controlling your anger, and especially controlling your physical behavior. Doesn't he? He does. In verse 5, Isaiah returns to the worthlessness of mere devotion. He describes a really good fast. A day for a person to humble himself, to bow his head, to spread sackcloth and ashes. And then he says, you think this is fasting? You you think these behaviors that we do, these Christian and godly behaviors, are, are inherently pleasing to the Lord? No. Not if there's a disconnect from your heart condition. Verses 6 and 7 show the true evidence of what your heart will be devoted to. Is not this the fast I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? The Bible is clear. Your heart, your mouth, and your hands are deeply connected. Jesus wanted followers who would have heart religion, not external show. 
He was speaking directly to this when he said, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. The angry words and angry fists and self-seeking pleasures that Isaiah has been exposing are evidence of the true state of our hearts. But justice and compassion are evidence of our hearts as well. Thus, true fasting is to loose the bonds of wickedness and undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. There are all kinds of yokes, all kinds of bondage in the world. In recent months, we've mentioned human trafficking, and the statistics are shocking. Over 2.4 million victims, 80% sold into sexual slavery, the remainder into forced labor like the boys of Lake Volta. It's a $32 billion industry. And get this, the average cost of a human being, go buy one, $90. There are many kinds of oppression. The Old Testament, for example, speaks about excess interest as a form of bondage. So I looked up the statistics on Rent-A-Center, which I've always felt was exploitive. Do you know that the interest rate on a rent-to-own TV is 160% annually? You get a $500 TV for $1,406 